but how God created us. And may I start out before we get into it and say that God did create this world. Amen. He created this world. It did not come to being by just coming together by itself. Right. Scientifically, you have to have time, energy, and matter in the same place in order to make something. Yeah. And I heard of one guy who went to witness to an atheist one day, and he sat down in his house, and he talked to him about the Lord, and he said, well, you just believe that everything just came from nothing. He said, wait a minute, I have to go into the kitchen and make a cup of tea, because it will not make itself. And this world did not come together by itself. Uh, I heard uh, what, one of the, the theories today is that, you know, this world was made and there are so many hundreds of different dimensions and in one dimension something came together that made this creation this dimension. And as I said on Sunday, you've got to have so much faith to believe that. Because the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. Now, he created it. Simple as that. The Bible says that I believe it. And that, that means that we don't have billions and billions of years and all coming together. It simply means, as God says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Amen. So that's very clear. So not only does God create the world, but he creates us. And he creates us in, in, in Genesis again, male and female. That's what the Bible says, male and female female not male and et and anything else you want to put in there male and female and it's always amazing to me people today come up to me and say why can't you accept me the way i am now wait a minute if you can't accept you the way that god made you how should i accept you the way you are now how do i know you're not going to change again you see god created us male and female and in this psalm as we saw a couple of weeks ago we were going to see how David was searched by God. And it's interesting in this psalm, in verse 1, in the last verse, it talks about being searched. Now, I don't know if you've ever been searched. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been put up against a wall and, and you know, I'm going to search you and all the rest of it. I've had that done to me. And I, when I was in the army, I used to do it to people. And in Spanish and in English and all kinds of stuff. But when you're being searched, it brings you to think about your position. You know, they talk about an education today about sitting down and having an evaluation of yourself, you know, and positive feedback. But as Christians, we need to do that as well. We need to ask God, what should I do? Where should I go? How should I live? And the reason why is you can, you can fool me and you can pretend to others but you can't fool God. He knows us. And that's where we start in verse number 13. He says, For thou hast possessed, I want you to notice this, my reins. Now, I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse. Horses are controlled by reins. And the thing about a horse and reins, you think, well, if you pull hard, that's the best thing to do. It's actually the worst thing you can do. It will make the horse go faster. You have to have a gentleness in the reins and let the horse and communicate through the reins and let the horse know what you want to do. And the Bible talks about that God can pull on our reins or he can just lead us gently. And David says here, you are controlling my reins. And my question tonight is who's controlling your reins? Is it yourself? Is it this sinful world? Is it Satan? Or is it the Savior? David said, you are controlling my reins. You've possessed my reins. David allowed God to control his life. Imagine we had a dozen Christians in Scotland today who said, I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do. I'm going to knock on any door God tells me to knock on. I'm going to talk to anyone about the Lord. I'm going to be 100% sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine how the devil would hate that. Imagine how the news would be upset with that. Christians on fire. You see, the world wants Christians to be quiet. Just keep out of sight. But Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. David said, you've possessed my reins. God was in charge of David. Is God in charge of us? 
Or are we doing what we want? How many times when my kids growing up, I tell them things to do and say, no, I'll do what I want. I'll do what I want. <laughs> really? As mature adults? Is that what we say to God? You know, in Psalm 14, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And not only that to the atheist, but also to the Christian who says, the fool has said in his heart, no God. I'm not allowing God to work in my life. David said, you've possessed my reins. And in order for God to possess his reins, David had to be completely honest with God. Now, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I think women are wonderful. I really do. Amen. They're fantastic. Yep. But they take so long to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> now guys were like, right, we're okay. And look, it's worth it. Don't worry. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely worth it. But if we took so much, as much time on these things as we ask God, what do you want in my life for today? I think we'd be better off. David said, you're controlling me. You're in charge of me. He had his reins by God. And the reason why is that relationship he had with God, because he created him, he said, Thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Now here we're going to start on some doctrine in the Bible that talks about why babies, God knows about them in the womb. Amen. I don't believe in abortion. Amen. Simple as that. Yeah. And the reason why is because the Bible says that even in the womb, God knows babies. Amen. Amen. In fact, the first person who rejoiced at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ before he was born was a babe in the womb, John the Baptist. It's always about, the kill it's always about killing the babies. They did it in Egypt. They'll do it in these times in which we live. When we understand how God created us, it brings us to awe and wonder. Look at verse number 14. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. You know, David knew nothing of modern science. He lived in what we call the Bronze Age. He didn't have microscopes. He didn't have computers. And even then he said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. If you look at the human body today, the cell structure, the billions and billions of cells. You know that you lose three million cells a day that die and are replaced every day? You know about the, 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 the intricacies of the, 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 the biological system, uh, homostasis, uh, where the body controls itself, keeps it in the right balance and all the rest of that. And you don't even have nothing to do with it. If you had to wake up every morning and tell your body, right, I want you to do this, control that, and do this, and these cells are going to die, God designed it that way. He didn't have all the things we have. He didn't know about all the cells, all the living creatures. He didn't know about all the different functions. But even he said in the bronze age, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Have you ever thought about your body? When it hurts, it hurts. It feels pain. It feels cold. It feels heat. It feels warmth. It feels full when you eat. It feels hungry. And look, we, we take our bodies for granted. We don't think about them until we're sick or when we batter a hammer across our thumb. But you know, God gave us a body that we might glorify him in that body. Paul said in Corinthians, we are the temple of God. David in the Bronze Age, running around with chariot wheels and swords and all the rest of it, said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. How did he know that? He knew it because of a relationship with God. When you walk with God, you understand that you are unique. Every there, there, now, and I realize this is probably going on there, the cloning and all the rest of it, but God made us individual. There are no two human beings who are the same. We are all unique. There's only one John McLennan. Thank the Lord for that. <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> Thank the Lord. We are unique. God made us that way. There's only one you. And there's only one you can do what God wants you to do. I can't do what God wants Bruce to do. 
But Bruce can do what God wants him to do. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He talks to God and he understands the position he has. Look at verse number 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect and in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Wait a minute. David is saying God knew him in the womb before he even came together. And he said there's a book where all is written down. If you read the book of Revelation, it talks about the books that are opened. The book of life and, and, and maybe many others. The, uh, the Bible says every word shall be given an, an, an account. So before David was even born, before his members, his cells came together, God recorded everything about David. Think about that for a second. Before he was even born, God knew. You read the, the uh, book of Jeremiah, it talks about the prophet, and, 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 and God speaks to him. He says, I have formed thee in the womb. That's a special kind of God that does that. Amen. God who creates. He says, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance. Do we understand that God sees us? I preached a couple of weeks ago, in fact, in, fact, in this, this, this chapter, you can't hide from God. Yeah. You ever play hide, play hide and seek as a kid? No. And I, I used to be a good hider. I used to get a good hider as well sometimes, but I was a good hider. I'd find these places and people would say, okay, the game's a bogey, the game's up the pole. And I'd come out of these wee places. But you cannot hide from God. Because God sees us. Yeah. I love that and talks about Philip. He, he says, I, God, I saw you under the tree. I saw you. In your darkest time, in your time of most pain, God sees. And he sees and he cares. There's a song that uh, I haven't sung in a long time. It's a good song. It's called, Does Jesus Care? When my heart is broke, with nameless dread and fear, Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. Shortest verse in the Bible. Who can tell me? Jesus wept. John eleven thirty two. 32. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept because people were crying over the fact that Lazarus was dead and buried. He wept. And we have to understand that not only does God see us, he considers us. Amen. He considers. Look at verse number 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. You know, I'm glad that we don't know what other people are thinking. <laughs> Imagine if, if your thoughts were flashed on a screen in front of you. Maybe even not a very edifying thing. No. But God knows all our thoughts. Amen. And his thoughts towards us are great mm. and gracious yeah. and good. How many times has God been good to us? Amen. How many times Amen. have we not deserved that goodness? Amen. How many times? Amen. All the time. The Bible says the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Mm. He says, how good. Great are the sum of thy thoughts towards me. He says in verse 8, If I should count them, they are more than number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. How many times has God blessed us? How many, how many blessings? You know, we sing that song, When upon thy billows you are tempest tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. David said, not only does God know me, not only does God search me, but he thinks about me. You ever think about that? God thinks about you. You know, I, I know we live in a day of technology and all the rest of it, but when my wife and I were used to, uh, we were, when we were courting, we would used to write letters. No, it wasn't an awe, it was a terrible thing. Because you had to wait a week to ten days for a reply. <laughs> so you'd write a letter... And uh, you, you get a reply 10 days later or something like that. And if she was late, it was longer than that. But it was always great to get a letter to realize that she was thinking about me. You think God thinks about you and me? 
and he's pleased not because of us but because of the blood of Christ covering our sins he, David said if I should count the number of thoughts that you have to me now remember David is wicked he, he's an adulterer he's a murderer he, 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 he sinned against God but God forgave that sin and God thought about David he said if I, if I were to count them how sad it is the philosophy of this world that look to this godless system for answers and there is no answers the world doesn't care let's be honest the world doesn't care about you doesn't care about me it doesn't care about many people it's all about money and power and corruption but God thinks about people especially his redeemed how does that affect me well he counsels me according to godliness look at verse number 19 surely thou wilt slay the wicked O God depart from me therefore ye bloody men for they speak against thee wickedly and thine enemies take thy name in vain you know there's something wrong when a Christian takes the name of God in vain amen I mean, when you, why is it they never say O oh, Buddha O oh, Confucius O oh, Allah or O oh, Muhammad why is it always Jesus why, 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 why do they always go after the name of Jesus why is it Jesus one of the marks of the ungodly is they take the name of God in vain. I remember speaking to a Jewish man one time, and, and, and he had an interesting look on this. And they talk about in, in, in Judaism, taking the name of God in vain doesn't necessarily only mean cursing God's name. But if you take the name of God and call yourself a Christian and don't live like it, you're taking that name in vain. You're saying that I'm this and you're not. That's taking the name of God in vain. If you don't live up to the name that you've taken as a Christian, then you've taken that name in vain. The ungodly take the name of God in vain. What did Jesus said? If the world hates you, it hated me first. This world hates grace. This world does not want to hear from God. If Jesus came down today and lived as he did 2,000 years ago, they would crucify him again absolutely but thank God he's not coming back for that he says this in verse number 20 they speak against thee wickedly and thine enemies take thy name in vain and look at verse 21 and here's the counsel of God in godliness do not I hate them O Lord they hate thee am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee you know the Bible talks about righteous indignation yeah. you know God loves the sinner and wants to save sinners but he hates sin Amen. He hates this corrupt world system. This demonic system of the world that is taking souls to hell. David said, I hate them. Verse 22, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. We live in an age that says, well, we should tolerate everything. We should just allow everything to go on and that's just fine. And there is a, a certain truth to that in that we don't control the laws of the country. But sin is still sin. Yeah. Wrong is still wrong. Yeah. And we should hate sin. Amen. Don't tell me you love Jesus and you love sin. Amen. They're, they're, they're completely opposite. Amen. If you love Jesus, you hate sin. Amen. If you hate Jesus, you love sin. Yeah. That's the counsel of God. Mm -hmm. This is a violent world that seeks not God's grace but seeks to hate God. People today are, are standing with their fist to God and, and challenging Him. Terribleness. They speak against thee wickedly. God looked for God, uh, David looked for God's plan. We are to walk in the light. And we get walking in the light as we live righteously. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 says this, This then is the message we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In the beginning of the psalm, David was searched by God. At the end of it, he asked to get searched again that tells me that we should seek for God's illuminating grace and wisdom to search our lives on a regular basis I remember 
Many years ago, I did some teacher training and uh, teaching maths in school. That was an interesting <laughs> subject. But I remember at the end of it, they always used to have, well, you had to uh, reflect on your teaching and reflect on how the students learn. And I'm like, two and two is still four. <laughs> and you know, someone said, I didn't get it. Well, <laughs> but the, you had to sit down and write and reflect about what you'd done, how you'd taught, how they'd received it, and all the rest of that. But as Christians, do we reflect on a monthly, a weekly, and a daily basis of what God is doing in our lives? Remember, David talks about the reins. You see, if you take back the reins and you're in control, then that's not a good thing. But if God is in control, David said, Search me, O God, verse 23. Search me, God, and know my heart, and try, try me, and know my thoughts. You know, if you want God to search, he's going to find out who you really are. <laughs> it's not a surprise to God. Amen. He already knows. Yeah, that's right. it, you, you're not going to surprise God with anything. There, there's, there's not one sin in your life that God does not know about. Not one. There's an old song that says, the one who knows me best loves me most. That's why he could say to God, search me. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a great prayer. Maybe tonight before you go to bed, maybe you should pray that prayer. Lord, search me. Know my heart. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. What wicked ways are in us that God would like to have removed? How many wicked ways? I remember, as I said before, when I first got saved, I was a punk rocker. Looked like a punk rocker, the, the hair and all the rest of it. And I remember reading my Bible and, and God spoke to my heart and my life began to change. And I always say, Lord, if there's something there that's not right, remove it. Now, sometimes God will prune it. Amen. Sometimes he'll let you do the pruning. And the Bible talks about God dunging it. Sometimes God will bring dung in your life to bring fruit in your life. But we don't want that. We like, we like it nice and clean. We, as I said before, we used to have a horse, and one of the great things about horses is I actually take the manure up to my uh, rose garden, and I'd throw it down there every day, and the neighbors go, oh, that's a terrible smell. But I had the best roses in the whole neighborhood. Everybody said, oh, those are wonderful. What do you do? I dung them. David said, search me. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. So my challenge to you tonight is, would you really ask God to search you and try you and say, Lord, if there's something in my life that's causing me to sin, take it away. Or give me grace to bear, because Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and God might just have to give you the grace to bear it for his glory and honor. It's a great psalm, Psalm 139. Yeah. Talks about searching. Talks about honesty. Yeah. One of the things I appreciate about David, he's so honest. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't try and fool you and say, I'm King David, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the head honcho, I'm the big king here. He says, search me. And the Bible says that, that David was a man after God's own heart. Amen. He was humble. Yeah. He was a man we should emulate yeah. by asking, Lord, search me. Know my heart. Try me. And, and if there be any wicked way, take it away. That's the honesty kind of Christianity that we need today. Real, Amen. practical, biblical, not sweet tooth, you know, namby-pamby Christianity Amen. where we all love each other and walk around going hum be hum But real practical Christianity. Amen. If God is not changing our lives, then our life needs to be changed. When we used to go to America many times, there used to be a lot of churches and they'd have a nursery. And every time you go to a nursery, they had a scripture verse above the door. And it says, for we shall all be changed. 
And the idea was, if you had a baby, while that baby was in the nursery, if it had an accident, they would change and clean up before you got it afterwards. <laughs> and I always used to say, that's what church is for. Come and get changed. Would you be free from their burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. There's still power to change us. If we're willing to be changed. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you. It's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, help us to be like David, to be willing to be searched, to be willing to be challenged, and Lord, to be willing to change, that you might be glorified and you might use us to reach this world with the gospel. Bless our, our time of invitation. Speak to our hearts, Lord. We do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.